Welcome to a special video podcast, Darfur, a first-hand eyewitness account of genocide with Dr. Jerry Ehrlich, recorded November 21st at Temple Emmanuel in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Now here's Dr. Ehrlich. Taking pictures in Darfur was prohibited. You had to get a special permit from the Sudanese government and you were monitored by a member of their security forces. They did not want pictures coming out of dark water. This was taken in Khartoum, the capital of Sudan. And there are hundreds and hundreds of these banners all over Khartoum. Peace and unity with the sign of a dove. My comment on this, a joke. Nothing but a cruel joke. Perhaps equivalent to the famous Nazi statement, Arbeit macht frei. Nothing but a joke. This is Darfur, summer of 2003, four, five, six, and onward. Drawn by an 11 year old girl. When I went to Darfur, I wanted to bring back images drawn by children. I brought with me 20 boxes of crayons and about 400 pieces of drawing paper. And I gave them out to kids, 9, 10, 11, 12, when they were being discharged from our medical center. And I just told these kids, have fun, draw whatever you want to draw, but if you can, bring me back, <coughs> excuse me, five or six drawings to take back home as a remembrance. And I really didn't think I'd get any drawings back, but to my amazement, these kids came back and back and back, and I wound up with 157 pieces of children's art. As the kids brought them back to me, I very rarely even looked at them. I stuffed them in my day pack in between an 80-page syllabus on malnutrition, and when I got back to my dormitory at night, when no one was looking, I took them out. I had a great big duffel bag. At the bottom of the duffel bag, it was a great big fat Sunday edition of the New York Times. And I stuck the drawings in between the pages. And that's how they got out of Sudan. In between the pages of the Sunday Times. Otherwise, they would have been destroyed. It's obvious what this child is drawing. Typical Darfurian village, mud brick thatch, in flames, airplanes dropping bombs, people dying, people running. The Sudanese government has bombed 95% of the villages in Darfur. These are not military targets. There's no rocket launchers there. There's no tanks. There's no guns. There's just people that have been farming there for thousands of years. Totally destroying 95% of the villages. This on the top here is what is known as the Janjui, the term you may be familiar with. J-A-N-J-A-W-E-E-D. Translated from Arabic to English, it means <coughs> devil on a camel. <coughs> and these are the armed, funded Arab militias that ride through the villages, throw live children into burning huts, kill all the men, and then throw the bodies down the wells to contaminate the water, steal anything of value, and then gang, and I'm not gonna use the word because we have a child here, but then gang all the women. Truly a devil on a camel. So why do they have to do that? They want to kill everybody. That's is that what that's the I'll get into the end the definition of genocide, but that's what genocide is. <clears throat> why 
Why did the Hutus do it to the Tutsis in Rwanda? You know, you can go on and on. Why did Pol Pot kill millions of Cambodians? This is what is known as a technical, which is a pickup truck with a rapid fire weapon that rides through the villages and shoots everyone in sight. Here you see a hut burning with a child in it. Again, another hut burning. Over and over again, <coughs> pictures of horrible violence. <coughs> this is the message these kids gave me to take back home. Yeah, this drawing was on the front page of the Newark Star Ledger in December of 05 under the headlines Carnage and Crayons. And a copy of this was sent to the International Criminal Court in The Hague, which in the spring of 09 indicted Omar al-Bashir, the president of Sudan, for crimes against humanity and genocide. This is the first time in history someone in power at the time has been indicted for crimes against humanity. Previously, it was all done after the fact. And this looks like someone in an army uniform, I'm sure you'll agree, shooting into the house. This implicates the Sudanese army's involvement in genocide. Again, someone shooting at the house, a technical, shooting this man in the head, perhaps his wife running after him. If you can make it out, down here, the young artist's signature in Arabic. Next. Rare picture of one of the young artists returning her drawings to me. And every time I look at this picture, there's two things that come into mind. Could she imagine the exposure of her artwork, shown over and over and over again to hundreds of live audiences like you today, up in universities, colleges, museums, libraries, churches, synagogues, untold websites worldwide, could she imagine the exposure of her artwork? And the other thing is, where is this sweet young girl today? Is she still there in this camp? Or is she another victim? <coughs> This is the drawing she's giving me. Here, the Janjaweed, the devil on a camel, the flag of Sudan, a technical, another technical airplane. This is the image she gave me. And people often ask, Jerry, where'd you get the idea of bringing back children's artwork from Darfur? I also brought it back from Sri Lanka. It came from, I never saw another butterfly. The children's artwork from Theresienstadt. That's where I got the idea. Now I'm gonna take you inside Kalma Camp, K-A-L-M-A. -A. This is where I spent my two months. This is one of the uh, internally displaced camps. Because their villages have been bombed and destroyed, these people have no place to go. They wander across the desert to certain locations where humanitarian aid organizations have set up shop, and that's where they're free. I'm sure you can appreciate the harshness of the desert. <laughs> this is <coughs> being built, covered here by matting, covered by straw, here, plastic sheeting over the top given out by humanitarian aid organizations to protect their huts during the rain. And when I arrived in Kalman, the estimated population was 30,000 displaced people. Every day that I went in, I could see it getting bigger and bigger and bigger. When I left two months later, it was 60,000. Recent article in the New York Times Kalma is now over 100,000 displaced people. 
And this is one of 26 camps in Darfur. Another view of Kamba camp, this is a latrine, and there's a huge pit in the ground here, and when filled with urine and feces, it's covered over. These pictures, every day I'd slip out of the medical center, usually around 2, 2.30, sneak out, wander through the camp. I had a camera in my backpack in between stethoscopes, otoscopes, syllabus, all sorts of odds and ends. When no one was looking, I'd take a picture here, a picture there, a picture there. I wound up with over 100 pictures to document the living conditions of the people of Darfur in these camps. The Sudanese government totally denies this. They tell you the blurb you see on TV, the articles you read in the newspaper, are strictly Western propaganda to recolonize the Sudan. <laughs> That's right. But here you see about two and a half million dark Orients are living. Totally dependent on humanitarian aid organizations for food, medical care, everything you can think of. Another view of Kalma camp, <clears throat> few men here. There weren't too many men, and most of them just wandered around time trying to scratch out a living. There was a school here in Kalma camp. It was a great big straw hut, had two classrooms, that held about 100, 150 students. I went to the school twice. The first time, via my translator, I addressed the students, telling them how important it was to continue to maintain an education, even in these horrible circumstances. And I went back several weeks later, and I met with the teachers to try to give them support. Only one out of every 10 children could go to school in Kalma camp. The school was just not big enough to handle the number of displaced children. Yeah, this is to show you the involvement in the United States government. If you could read this, it says United States of America disaster relief. And what's in these huge sacks, they're flown into an airport about 10 miles away are have blankets or mats, and they're driven by truck to the shelter. And someone will come in a wheelbarrow and bring it to this young lady's hut. So she'll have a blanket to sleep on or mats to sleep on instead of sleeping on the desert floor. We are the biggest donor of humanitarian aid to dark war, which is much to our credit. But what these people need is really security, and they have not obtained it right up to this minute. Okay, now I'm going to take you into the medical center, show you what I did when I wasn't taking pictures and collecting children's artwork. And this was built by local laborers, designed by uh, one of our logisticians. Here you see the doctors without borders flag, indicating a safe haven. This is the waiting room, which I'll go into in a minute. And here you see moms all lined up, typical African style, babies on their back. And they're lined up waiting to go into the waiting room. And this is the waiting room. And this is the first thing I saw every morning, roughly eight o'clock when I arrived. And what I did myself and my translator would crawl through all these kids and make what we call an eyeball or a visual diagnosis. We'd pick out one, two, three, four children that were critical, could not wait the hours for a routine exam. We took them right out of the waiting room into one of the shelters, which we jokingly called the ICU, and began treatment right away. Otherwise, they couldn't have survived. This is one of the eight shelters. We fed all the babies, we fed all the mothers, we had special formulas, feeding routines for the kids. 
Obviously, I could not examine 200 patients a day. I was very, very dependent on the guidance of the nurses who were monitoring and looking at the patients and directed me to kids that were sick and needed care. And again, I would just crawl through all these kids. The charts were there. You'd write notes, you'd examine them. Try to care for them the best you can. This is what we saw over and over and over again. Severe malnutrition. This child's two and a half years old. Once upon another lifetime, he ran, he jumped, he chattered. He did everything a normal two and a half year old did. Now he is so weak, all he can do is lie here. And he's extraordinarily vulnerable. Because of his malnutrition, his lungs are very, very predisposed to pneumonia. His intestinal tract to diarrhea, which can wipe him out quickly. His kidneys cannot handle normal amounts of salt and water. You have to be very careful in rehydrating these children. And what's most important of all, because of the malnutrition, his immune system is severely compromised. For medical purposes, for all practical purposes, this is like treating a child with AIDS. Only his immune system has not been compromised by the human immunodeficiency virus but if malnutrition has done the exact same thing to his immune system as HIV. And that's how we had to treat these kids. I'm sure you can appreciate the relatively large head, sunken eyes, the ribs, the thin arms. Over and over again, again, totally denied by the Sudanese government. They tell you the people of Darfur are well fed and well cared for. Again, malnutrition, the look on this child's face, the sunken abdomen, the ribs, the pelvis, you can see the bones. Here you see the sand floor with the mats. And again, this is how I spent my days crawling through there. The look on this child's face, this pathetic look, but look at the look on this mom's face. And this is a look of post-traumatic stress disorder. Because all she has seen, all she has endured, she's suffering severe mental illness called post-traumatic stress disorder. And no matter what I did, I'd hold their hands, I'd give them a hug, I would try to do anything to reassure them. But this is what I got back, just this look. And when the conflict in Darfur ends, it's going to take an immense amount of therapists to deal with this problem. Again, this mom, the look of post-traumatic stress disorder. And her five-year-old child, barely able to sit up. Look at the thinness of the arms and the rib cage. The older sibling, she's in much better shape. And the older kids could tolerate malnutrition much better than the younger ones. Yeah, this I love to show to my colleagues because we never see this. It's hard to see on the black skin, but this is measles. I think you might be able to appreciate the rash here and some of the rash here. <laughs> this over here is the child's arm bracelet with his ID, and here you see his chart that is next to him, monitoring temperature and so forth, and, and all drugs that he's on, and that's where I'd write notes and write orders for the nurses, just like here. We had a measles epidemic and when I was at Kalma camp, and measles killed one out of every four children with malnutrition. They just could not fight the measles virus. We had measles vaccine flown in from Europe and we just immunized everyone standing. 
everyone with it. They thought they had measles vaccine. They didn't know. We just immunized everybody and we truly aborted a catastrophe. We saved an awful, awful lot of lives. Yeah, this is to show you some of the crazy things you did. I think you may be able to appreciate the comatose look on this child's face. And when he arrived in the center, he needed an IV. But because of the dehydration, malnutrition, and infection, he was in the state of what we call vascular collapse, and you couldn't put an IV in. And what you do in those cases, you put a needle right through the tibia, the big bone in the leg, right through it into what's called the bone marrow, which is a cavity in the bone, and you can visualize that as one big non-collapsible vein. And you get into the bone marrow, and then you can infuse antibiotics, fluids, salts, anything you want to do. Now, I've done this in the U.S. many times. You do it in the ER, you have two nurses helping you, you're wearing gloves, the area is scrubbed down, the child is sedated here, dirt floor, bare hands, long needle, just the mom holding the child, I put it in. Here you see a rear father holding the tubing, the bottle is up here attached to the <laughs> ceiling of the shelter, and he got his fluids and he got his antibiotics. It runs for about three, four hours till you restore circulation. Then you can take it out and place the standard IV. The look on this mom's face. I hope this guy knows what he's doing. It was very gratifying when she left the hospital three days, left the center three days later. She was very emotionally happy. Yeah, this again, something extraordinarily rare, very seldom seen in the United States, called quashi orcor. And it's due to severe protein mal malnutrition. And I think you can appreciate the swelling of the feet, swelling of the legs, swelling of the face. And this requires very careful expertise in treating. Because if you give too much fluids initially, you give too much protein, all you do is mobilize the fluids from the legs, from the feet, from the face, into the lungs, and then you get fluid in the lungs and you're really in deep trouble. So this has to be treated very, very carefully with a lot of expertise. Again, extraordinarily rare in this country, but we saw, we saw a lot of it there. Yeah, this is something I'm extraordinarily proud of. The training of two local Darfurian doctors. And this is how medicine has been taught since the temples of ancient Greece. Dr. Ghazali is examining the patient. Dr. Najil is watching. I took the picture. When he's all finished, I might examine the child. Dr. Najil might examine the child. Then we'll step back, we'll discuss the case, arrive at a diagnosis and treatment. This is how medicine has been taught, as I said, since the temples of ancient Greece. And I was so happy to be involved in their education. My last night in Darfur, they took me into a little town to a rinky-dink photography studio, and they had multiple pictures of me taken with them. They wanted to remember me as part of their education. And again, I wonder, where are these two young doctors today? Miriam. One day, wandering through combat camp, taking my illegal pictures, I passed the hut, and I smelled what smelled like coffee coming out of there. And I stuck my head into the hut, and there was Miriam, who scratched out a living, running a coffee tea shop. And every day became a ritual. After I took my pictures, I dropped into Miriam's hut, 
sit on some benches, chatter away with whoever was there, give her a hug, and then tell her in Arabic, Bukri, I'll see you tomorrow. One day I had to tell her I won't be back. And again I wonder, is Miriam still there running her coffee tea shop? But again, look at Miriam's face. The look of post-traumatic stress disorder. No matter what I did, hold her, hug her, this is the only look anyone got. <clears throat> Mary and Abdullah, two nurses I could have never survived without. Two dedicated, motivated, knowledgeable nurses who were monitoring patients and had an uncanny ability to pick out kids that were turning bad and they'd come and get me and direct me to those patients. So very, very dependent on their dedication and ability to wonderful, hardworking nurses. And at this time, I always acknowledge the person that took this picture, my translator, who goes nameless, because he knew about the pictures I was taking, he knew about the children's artwork I was smuggling out, and the Sudanese government would have known that he would have been gone in the blink of an eye. Truly someone who put his life in danger every day so that word could come out. My translator. Now I think the last, the last picture. People say, Jerry, what the heck did you accomplish in Darfur? You went to this land of unspeakable atrocities, of this heaven-forsaken country, what did you accomplish? Look at this young mom, look at that beautiful smiling face, and ask her. When she came into the center, this is all she had left. The rest of her family was assassinated. He was quite ill, and we got him better, and she's going home with him, and this is the look she gave me, and this is the look I want you to remember. Maybe someday he'll grow up to be a fine young citizen of Darfur, and she'll tell him, once upon a time you were very, very sick, and this funny old white doctor came from this far off place, the United States of America, and he helped us, and he helped you get better. Maybe this is it, this one child. As it states in the Talmud, who saves a life, saves the world. And maybe this is it, this one young child and his mom. And that's, that's it. We hope you enjoyed this presentation, which was produced in the studios of Professional Podcasts in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, on the web at professionalpodcasts.com. Thank you for joining us.